8 kids, if you ever wanted to know what happens to your uh, Raspberry Pi when you don't shut down RetroPie properly, this is it. Um, I'm having to do a uh, FSCK check file system from the command line. Um, never seen it do this before, but I hope that when it gets to the end of this, I'll be able to boot into RetroPie as normal and talk about something that Alex asked about in the comments on my last video um, which was getting the Sinclair ZX Spectrum emulator to work. Um, turns out there are some differences between the stable binary build of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum emulator uh, on the Raspberry Pi B Plus um, in comparison to the stable binary build of the emulator for the version that will run on the retro part, uh, on the Raspberry Pi 2 which is the model I've got. Uh, I have a B plus um, but uh, it's currently awaiting another project which we you all will become revealed in the fullness of time. Um, so once this is booted up, uh, hopefully booted up, we'll go in and take a look at the Sinclair ZX Spectrum emulator running um, and then go to a screen capture of the command line to show you, uh, to show you guys who've, who've still got the B plus, the file that you need to fix in order to get the Spectrum emulator working. Because it turns out that there's actually a typo in one of the configuration files that stops the Sinclair Spectrum emulator from uh, looking at the folder with the ROM files in it uh, and and seeing valid files. And it's literally there's been a full stop missing from the beginning of the um, wildcard. Um, file name so you put that full stop back in uh, and the RetroPie emulation station will be able to see uh, all of the files in your ROMs folder for the Spectrum as being valid um, ROM files so I'll pause the video for a second and come back once this is booted up and uh, yeah see you in a sec yeah we're back um, that worked no problem so we'll just go into the Sinclair ZX Spectrum emulator and uh, Go down to my favourite, favourite game. The only thing about this simulation station is it's a bit difficult to navigate long lists of files. It would be nice to be able to just um, maybe tap a key on the keyboard to go to... Um, there we go, Bruce Lee. Uh, to go to um, the particular file that you'd like to get to, but um, I'm sure that is a possible modification. So. Just while we wait for it to load the emulator. Now, there's a rather unique quirk with this particular emulator that even if you click on a, uh, a valid ROM file, it actually just boots into the regular ZX Spectrum basic loader. Um, to bring up the list um, of ROM files that are valid, it's necessary to tap the F1 key on the keyboard and you get a rather nice little kind of um, sort of um, spectrum style menu system that you can navigate with the up down left right and enter keys um, then it's necessary to um, navigate to the ROM files folder again so it doesn't really matter what uh, image you you open um, from the emulation station you've still got to go in and do it from in here which is a bit I don't know maybe that's a unique bug to my particular version um, but um, scroll down here and find BR where are we BR come on BR 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 Bruce Lee there we go lovely stuff and um, you know it's a, it's a working version of Bruce Lee so QAOPM lovely jubbly now I mentioned earlier on about how um, it's necessary to do a little bit of fiddling around with the configuration files um, if you're running this emulator on the Raspberry Pi B plus. So let's go over to the command line and take a look at that. Previous video, uh, I might have rushed through a little bit how you actually um, 
log in to the Raspberry Pi from terminal. Uh, so we're just going to take a quick look at that. To, f to find out your IP address, assuming that your Raspberry Pi is connected via Ethernet to the same uh, network as your computer, you're going to want to use a command called nmap um, with the switch of sn. And then the first three digits of your IP address, in my case, are going to be... Now, to find out what your local IP addresses are, you need to go into um, something like... On the Mac, you would go into System Preferences uh, and open up um, Network Settings. Um, just do that quickly. So if you open up the System Prefs and then go to Network, you can see that um, your cable modem router whatever is assigning IP addresses that start 192.168.0 right and the Mac is on four right so that you, that's how you find out the first four digits of your IP of your local IP address so I know that I want to tell nmap to sn 192.168.0.0 forward slash let's say 24 right uh, and that's going to scan all the possible IP addresses that are being assigned within that range and give me an output that lets me know that the Raspberry Pi is on 192.168.0.10. So that's how you find out the IP addresses of all the devices that are on your local area network, right? So with that in mind, we want to SSH into the Pi, and we know that the username is Pi, and that its server address is at 192.168.0.10. It's then going to ask me for the password, which by default in RetroPi we know is Raspberry, now we are remotely logged into the Retro Pi, okay? Uh, to the Raspberry Pi running Retro Pi. Now, earlier on when I was saying about this file that has a typo in it on the um, Raspberry Pi B Plus version of the Spectrum emulator, to edit that file, uh, we're going to want to go into a directory which is before the home directory on the hard drive of the Raspberry Pi. So if we list all the files in the home directory that we get dropped into by default, we're not going to be able to find that configuration file because it's further back than where, where the home folder is. So to go back, we call directory dot dot. You can see that that takes us into a folder called pi. If we call directory dot dot, it takes us back again into the root directory. So if we now, see this is the contents of the entire root directory on, on the retro pi. If we now call directory etc and list the files in here, it's a fairly cluttered, confusing looking mess, but through uh, a great deal of trial and error, I discovered that the folder that you really want to be looking for is called Emulation Station. So we call directory emulate, and if we just type the first couple of characters in the terminal command line uh, of, of the directory or the file that we want to open, and then hit the tab key, you can see that uh, termina uh, terminal tries to complete the rest of the address for us so that we don't have to type in long paths. So we're now in the emulation station folder, and we ls switch a, so to list all files. We can see that in here there's a backup of the ES systems configuration, and there's the ES systems configuration file itself. Now, to open that, we're going to use an application called nano. So we're literally just going to say nano open es underscore systems dot cfg. And this is a command line text editor basically and it tells um, emulation station which is uh, the part of RetroPi that that actually opens the different emulators um, it tells it what kinds of files it needs to be thinking about looking for in the ROMs folder that corresponds to that particular emulator now as you can see I, it's actually made a layer out of me there there is um, there is a typo in this version too, so it's a good job I checked. You can see here, for the Neo Geo for example, uh, the extension part there that's open and then closed, it says the files you're going to want to look for for a Neo Geo are .zip, .zip in uppercase, .fba and .fba in uppercase. On the Spectrum emulator, if we just take the screen up a little bit, you see, on the one that says extension and then close extension there, the full stop is missing from the beginning of the Z80 files with the lower case Z. So, literally, bring the cursor down to the front of there, put in a full stop, and that's the only change you need to make to this text file. Um, you can see down here, 
it says to exit, you want to hit uh, control and X. Uh, that little up arrow thing there is how control is represented on command line. So control and X. It's, uh, it's going to say, do you want to save the changes you've made? You just hit Y for yes. And it's going to ask you what file name you want to call it. So you say ES system CFG. Now something interesting is going to happen here when I say OK, right? Error, writing ES system CFG permissions denied. Now the reason for that uh, is that we need to open nano as the root user or the super user. So we're going to exit out of there and say no, we don't want to save. And instead of just typing nano ES system CFG, we're going to say sudo nano ES systems CFG. It's now opened exactly the same text file again, except this time it's done it with us logged in as the root user. And that's what sudo does. So if you ever come across situations where it says, no, I can't let you do that, oftentimes you can often just put in exactly the same command that you think should work, preceded by the word sudo, and it'll let you go in and make changes as the root user. So we're going to come down here to where the typo is, put in a full stop, exit, say yes, ESSystems.cfg, this time it's going to let us do it because we're logged in as a root user. Now, when you go into the Spectrum emulator on uh, Emulation Station RetroPie, it's going to let you see all of the files that have got a dot lowercase z80 file extension. So there's that one fixed. Uh, here's me thinking that it had been fixed. Um, because, because mine was working, I presumed it had been fixed on the version of this that was released for the... Um, uh, Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi 2, but it turns out it's actually still in there. So it's a good job that I uh, checked. Now, there is another way to do this. We're going to call directory dot dot, call directory dot dot, call directory dot dot, and go back into home slash pi slash retro pi. I'll tell you what, I'll do it, I'll do it graphically because call directory home and we see that that's the contents of home call directory pi we could have just typed in the full path if we knew what the path was and you get to memorize these things after you've been doing it for a while but uh, we want to call the directory retro pi now if I if if I just leave it at that and hit the tab key it's going to try and complete it but it's only going to pick the first directory so hit the tab key after putting in a dash and it goes oh yeah I, I can see that there's a folder called that and it'll fill it in automatically so sometimes you've got to type more than a few characters to use the autocomplete tab key but um, most of the time it works pretty well <coughs> excuse me now in the contents of this folder or this directory I should say uh, there's a couple of applications that we can run as as a super user using sudo um, and the one that we're interested in is called retropy setup sh okay so ret row pi underscore s tab well that's not going to work because there's already another file with that name i think oh sorry no made a mistake sudo space dot forward slash is the way that you execute uh, a shell script uh, command in the in the terminal so we say retro pi setup.sh. Is that clear as mud? Okay. This is going to open a bash script uh, sort of graphical interface to the Raspberry Pi RetroPi setup um, subroutines or whatever they are. These first two here would be what you would see if you were installing everything from scratch, right? But because you've downloaded the disk image from the RetroPie website that's already kind of pre-populated with, with the, the latest binary stable builds, you don't really need to go into here too much. Um, so you can have a look at things like the setup, you know, you can overclock the Raspberry Pi from in here um, and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, there's some things in here like being able to build slightly different, there's a version of Minecraft, uh, Dark Places Quake, there's a SNES, a different SNES emulator than the one that comes by default and so on. Oh, it even lets you install Cordy, which is rather nice because, um, yeah, I might do that later actually because um, I've got my RetroPie on a really large uh, SD card that would be nice to use as a media uh, thing as well. What we're interested in is going into here, source-based installation, right? And if you go all the way down here, 
I can't remember which one of these is the default version which comes with uh, the binary stable build of um, RetroPie. But if I just open up uh, one of the ROMs folders on the uh, shared directory, I'll be able to pick that up. Be able to tell you exactly. Go all the way down here. So, but yeah, the default one is basically uh, Fuse because that's the one that I've got already populated with 500 and odd meg of Spectrum games. The other one, which isn't installed, is FBZX. So we can see from here that we can install FBZX from the source uh, if we really want to have two ZX Spectrum emulators on there. FBZX, when I had my Raspberry Pi B+, Plus, was the one that worked better than Fuse, which is installed by default. Uh, for example, earlier on, if you remember when I opened up the ROM image of Bruce Lee, it opened up the Spectrum emulator, but didn't actually load the ROM. If you install Fuse, uh, or FBZX, I should say, say, from this screen here, where you've got you know installs from source, then it will actually go direct to the ROM image that you picked from the emulation station browser screen. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and do that right now, because uh, I'm, I've got it working without any of that. Uh, anyway, um, and it can take quite a long time for things to install from source files. But if you absolutely positively have to be sure that everything's working as well as it can work, you can do, you can reinstall the entire RetroPie system from source files so that you're basically installing the very latest version that the developers are working on. Obviously, that has its own downside. There might be bugs in there that they've not noticed. So if, if you're just wanting to literally use your emulation station for, for casual gaming, then you want to go with the latest binary builds that are stable. Um, but if you're a tinkerer and a nerd like what I am, uh, then um, that'll be the, the way to go so that you can uh, get more of an idea of what's happening. Um, you know, from building things from source. Um, the other thing to notice in, in this setup screen is that um, you can uh, in install... You know, if, if there's ever an update comes out, rather than going and getting the new fresh image and put it on a memory stick and basically starting from scratch, you can update the RetroPie binaries from in here and it'll go out to the RetroPie website and see if there's any updates. Um, and if there is, it'll download them and install them. Uh, so that's basically where you do your um, updates for the latest version. Um, and I think that's going to just about do it for now. Uh, again, ask any questions that you like. If I can answer them, I'll try. I will. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, the Raspberry Pi is absolutely fantastic for this kind of thing. The thing I'm going to look at next in my next video on the Pi is the uh, Open Elec um, Cody uh, Home Media Center, uh, which is uh, I've been using, to be honest with you, I've been using it as my main TV <laughs> for about the past fortnight now. Uh, it's sort of changed the way that I, I, I watch uh, even regular television from... Um, you know, iPlayer and YouTube and things like that because it's so fast on the new RetroPie 2 that it's um, it's 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 a real serious contender for being a, a you know a heavyweight media player. So we're going to look at that next, and also going to look at some of the add-ons that you can build into it um, by adding repository folders and downloading third-party uh, add-ons and scripts and uh, all of that kind of fancy stuff. So thanks for watching. Uh, see you in the dish with the foil. Night night.